welcome to our patient. And this is Alex Trebek. And if you are a Jeopardy watcher, you know him well. I am not a huge Jeopardy watcher, but he's been around so long that, you know, us old people know each other. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the progression of a patient care when it comes to cancer. And if you know, um, recently Alex Trebek has diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So where do we start when we're starting with a patient that is diagnosed with cancer? We start with, we have to find something, all right? Um, and if you look at or read any of this stuff with Alex Trebek, how he found something is that he was having abdominal pain, all right? And he was having some abdominal pain. It wasn't going away. He couldn't figure out what was going on. And so that is what created him or caused him to go in. Now, when we talk about cancers that are in the abdomen, it kind of sticky and it can be kind of hard for us to find cancers that are in the abdominal cavity that you're talking about liver, pancreas, spleen, um, uterine, ovarian, any of these cancers, um, colon, renal, I mean, just any of them are so hard to find. Why are they hard to find? Because our abdominal cavity is squishy. It can it just extend out um, however far it needs to. And so it takes a really long time before we can find something with um, within that abdominal cavity, usually pain, but remember cancer doesn't hurt. So what was causing the pain was whatever his cancer was starting to push on. That's why it's really important for us to understand our anatomy because understanding where the pancreas is and understanding that it's gonna start pushing on potentially the um, colon or potentially the liver, um, potentially some ducts that go through the pancreas and deliver those pancreatic enzymes. So that pain could have been from the backup of pancreatic enzymes. It could have been from putting pressure on blood vessels that were going to different organs and causing the backflow and the ischemia from the, um, the blood volume not getting to certain tissue. So pain is a really, really interesting symptom because most of us, if we have some belly pain, we're like mm, a little gas bubble, whatever, and we ignore it. Um, it's really important that we, when we are having pain, that it triggers in our head, there's probably something that we need to check on, okay? Um, I believe when I read stuff on him, he said that his tumor was about the size of a fist. So what I want you to do is I want you to ball up your hand right now and look at that size. That's how big that tumor was before it started to cause a problem. Now, when we think about tumors, small tumors can cause just as much of problems depending on their location. If you've got a small tumor, say in the brain or maybe um, right by a ureter, um, that's gonna cause problems because that small tumor, even though it's small, is causing a backup and a backflow and causing problems so things aren't going through. And then that's causing the pain. Cancer itself does not hurt. It's what the cancer pushes on. It's the blood flow that is stopped because of the blockage or because of the pressure. So first we have to find something. And with Alex Trebek, um, you know, a fist sized tumor is probably pretty large and probably causing some elevation in the pancreatic enzymes, causing some elevation um, in maybe potentially the liver enzymes. That's why we have to understand depending on what we see is going to depend on what we look for. So when we're looking for something, um, this is what our screening techniques are looking for, right? We're looking to find something. So we're going to screen. So your, um, your CT scan for looking for like your lung cancers, um, your uh, mammography, looking for the breast cancers, you know, the mammograms. I can't spell this morning. Um, your mammograms, other things. Um, you have a PSA, which is a blood draw. Okay. And that's looking for your prosthetic um, uh, enzyme or antigen that's looking at what is being released. And when that elevates, that means we have some inflamed prostate gland going on and we need to be paying attention to it. All right, so these are all our screening techniques. Um, pap smears, looking for cervical changes. Um, anytime we have bleeding that is of unknown origin, 
definitely a curious for something. If you're bleeding, we've probably got something going on that we need to pay attention to. Blood should not be outside of the vascular system. Um, so when we're looking, when we're finding something, we're looking at those screening techniques, you know, those questions. We talked about um, the, the Cancer Association uses the word caution. I'd make sure you know what each one of these things means. C-A-U-T-I-O-N, caution. Those are your gonna be some of your screening symptoms, things that you're gonna be looking for. Other things that might be screening might be anybody with some neuro changes, right? Because then we're like, huh, something's wrong because they've had some changes in their brain. Um, so those are kinds of things. Um, bowel changes, bowel and bladder change. Um, again, that's putting pressure on those, those spaces. So it's really important. These are all screening techniques. These are not going to diagnose. These are not diagnostic tools. These are screening tools, right? In order to diagnose, that's the next step. So you got to find something. And sometimes finding something is as simple as you get a chest x-ray for whatever, you know, a, a pneumonia or something. And then they look and they see that something else is there. And so a lot of times when we are finding something, it's accidental. Um, a lot of, uh, we've got screening techniques that we're going to use to try and find something. But honestly, a lot of times finding something is accidental. And our goal for screening techniques is to find stuff early. If we find it early, we find it small, we find it quick, we can get it out. It hasn't metastasized, it hasn't spread. We have a lot more cure rate if we can find it early. So, all right, so we've screened Alex. He came in, he had abdominal pain. We checked him out. Um, they did some, some ultrasounds. That would be another type of screening technique, an ultrasound of the abdomen to look and see, and they saw something in there. So now our next stage is now we have to go to biopsy. You cannot diagnose cancer without a biopsy. Now we can decide not to do a biopsy because if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. So if it looks like cancer, if it's acting like cancer, if it's doing the things cancer does, then sometimes we may not do a biopsy. But in order to do a biopsy, we've got to get that tissue sample. Okay. And this is where the nursing role changes, right? So before we were doing screening and education and um, the kind of proactive stuff. Now we have something. So now we've got to do a biopsy. So now you have to start thinking about as a nurse, how would I work with this patient that is going to have a biopsy? So I have to understand the different types of biopsy. Are they having a um, aspiration biopsy or a needle aspiration biopsy where they go in and they take out some tissue with a needle. So for Alex, you would go, excuse my drawing here, Alex, we're going to go in with a needle into the pancreas, um, in through the abdominal tissue and poke and get out some of that. There's always potential for bleeds. There's potentials for um, opening that tumor more. Okay. So that's always something that we could do. We could maybe go in for a needle biopsy. Um, sometimes you'll hear baby people say a puncture. They did a puncture biopsy. Um, and that's just where they literally go in and take out a piece of it. Um, a lot of times our biopsies are done with surgery and they use, they remove the tumor and then they check and see, they send that to pathology and they see how bad or how much mutation is in those cells. So that's something we can understand too is surgery. So then you have to think about what are you doing? What's your job as the nurse for surgery? your pre-op, your pre-op, so you've got your checklist, okay? What Think about what things would be on that pre-op checklist. Have you worked in long-term care or rehab and seen the nurses get somebody ready for surgery that morning where they're gonna go to surgery? Um, have you been at St. Elizabeth and seen the pre-op checklist that's in the computer when you're looking and evaluating your patient because maybe they've come back from surgery? The pre-op checklist is really important. It um, usually has stuff like their H&P, their most recent labs, um, if they've got all the correct armbands on, if they've got um, the correct fall color socks, whatever's on there um, is 
is pretty interesting. So I would make sure if you haven't seen a pre-op checklist, make sure you're going to Google or something and you're looking for one and looking what kind of stuff is on that because that's really important. Other things that might be important for surgery is our antibiotics, right? Because we're gonna have cut time. And so with um, surgery, we always are making sure that we're giving an antibiotic usually within 30 to 60 minutes of cut time. And we wanna make sure we're giving that antibiotic. Sometimes, depending on if they have antibiotics currently going, it might have to shift our times or we may send that antibiotic down to um, OR with them. But if you're working pre-op or anything like that, we wanna make sure we're looking at antibiotics. Other things we might wanna pay attention to ahead of time is are they on any anticoagulants? Because you do not wanna cut on someone who's been on an anticoagulant. You wanna make sure you're cutting on someone who has been um, not, definitely not on one of those. What's the risk? Huge bleeding issues, okay? Um, bleeding or even platelet issues. So we wanna make sure that we're taking care of our patients um, and making sure we get that pre-op checklist because if we don't get that pre-op checklist done before that patient goes to surgery, um, that is going to delay their surgery. That is going to make doctors and the surgical staff very, very unhappy, um, not just with you, but with the whole process. So that pre-op checklist, let's make sure we prioritize it and get it done. In the next couple times at St. E's, make sure you're going and looking at a pre-op checklist there. Make sure you're going on Google and you're looking to see the different types of checklists depending on what they're going through. Um, so those are kind of the important things for a patient with surgery. There are other things. We've talked about other ways that we might get tissue. They might do an ultrasound with a needle aspiration. So then we have to understand what do we have to do to prep that patient for that ultrasound for that needle aspiration, okay? Um, other things they might do is a bronch, okay? Or bronchoscopy, where they go down with a scope so they can see the, um, the tissue, right? I don't know about you, I don't wanna be awake during that. So you're definitely gonna have somebody that has sedation. You're gonna have somebody that's gonna have, um, I don't know, I, I gag on my toothbrush. So make sure um, that we have some sort of numbing stuff for the throat um, because they're gonna have a, th a huge tube um, shoved down there. But then we have to think about as they're coming back from this procedure, what, what is my priority? If we're numbing that throat, what do I wanna make sure before um, we're given some pills or any of that kind of stuff? I want to make sure I'm evaluating a swallow. And so it's those kinds of things that you have to start thinking about, not only just the procedure, but as a nurse, what are my before procedure plans and what are my after procedure plans? And so that's really important that you think about, okay, they're going to do a bronch, they're going down the throat, they're probably going to sedate them, they're probably going to numb their throat. So as the nurse getting this patient back, what kinds of things am I going to have to worry about? Probably vital signs, Q15 minutes, Q30 minutes, Q an hour for so long. Um, I'm probably also going to have to watch when they're waking up, pain and discomfort, checking that swallow. Anytime we mess with somebody's throat, we always want to check a swallow because I don't know about you. I don't want to put hydrocodone down into somebody's lung. If we're already doing a bronchoscopy, they probably already have some lung issues. So definitely for a biopsy, that's our next step. We have to get some tissue sampling. And when we get that tissue sampling, then they'll start to do those different grades of the, the tumor node and metastasis, or they'll start doing like staging. So a lot of times we can't do staging until we have some tissue and we know what we're working with. So once we're to that point, now we're going to our treatment options. So there's kind of some, some pretty basic standard treatments, right? We've got internal, which is gonna be our chemo, right? Typically our chemo is internal. And then we have external treatments. And this, um, oh, I don't know if I like those two things. Never mind, ignore those. All right, so for our treatment options, we have chemo, which is gonna be IV, PO, um, they can give it interthecally, they can give it um, uh, transdermally. I mean, we can give chemo pretty much anyway. And then we have radiation. 
Okay, and radiation can be internal or external, depending on the type of radiation that it's going. It all treats internally because that's where the cancer is, but um, external radiation is the one we know the most. That's the one where they go and it goes through the external tissue into the internal tissue or internal where we actually put radiation into someone. So, and this is really, um, a lot of this information is in your podcast and really kind of hones in on the different types of radiation and then the different nursing interventions that go with that radiation. When it comes to chemo, chemo's goal is to kill fast growing cells. I don't know how to say that enough. Chemo's goal is to kill fast growing cells. So it is going to um, go through and it's going to kill at different um, uh, stages of cellular growth and different chemos kill at different cellular growth stages. So it's really important that we pay attention to that chemo is gonna kill the fast growing cells. So what are the three fast growing cells that we don't wanna kill? Blood all parts of it, white cells, red cells, um, platelets, all those parts of it are all fast growing cells. So chemo hurts all of them. Um, mucous membranes, we talked a little bit about this already, that those mucous membranes, think about when you burn your, burn your cheek, those mucous membranes become a really big issue. Um, hair, those are all fast growing cells. Now, not everyone loses hair. Okay, not everyone loses their hair. So it's really important that we um, talk to people before they start shaving their heads um, of what kind of chemo they're getting. But every chemo will cause, can cause issues with their mucus, mucositis or stomatitis depending. And then everyone will cause problems with their blood, um, both all the cells that are in your blood. All right, so these are kind of our treatment options. Chemo, usually this is going to be if you've got somebody who's got significant spread already um, or they're trying to prevent that spread. Radiation, that um, can tend to be very specific to a tumor. Um, you don't usually radiate the whole body. Chemo is the whole body. Radiation is usually very, very specific. Kind of cool about radiation though now, before we used to, so say this is our person with cancer, um, and let's say they have a tumor right here. Um, the cool thing, the bad thing about radiation, what it used to be is radiation used to all be one beam. And this was 100% of the radiation. So you have to think about all that tissue that that's going through. But now our radiation is they use a multi-beam um, situation. So you have a beam that goes here, a beam that goes here, and a beam maybe that comes from this angle. So this is 33%, this is 33%, this is 33%, and 100% of it is all right there. What's nice about that is, again, think about your anatomy. Think about all this area in here where the radiation is going through that now is only getting a third of the radiation instead of 100% of it. So it's really nice because we don't see nearly the amount of burns and tissue damage we used to see um, and the other organs getting damaged in the way. A lot of your breast cancer patients, um, after they have radiation, they now are at risk for um, rib fractures because that radiation went through. Radiation doesn't just stop when it reaches the tumor, it goes all the way through. So you have to think about it um, as like almost one of the superheroes when they shoot people, that it goes all the way through them. It doesn't just stop at a, where the, the spot is. All right. So we've talked about the different treatment options, chemotherapy, radiation. Um, there's different treatment options. Um, there's a lot of holistic ones out there. There's a lot of alternative treatment options out there. And be very, very, very careful. These patients are very susceptible to um, trying to find whatever they can because they want to survive. So I had one person that was ready to fly down to Mexico and get some sort of shark fin pee um, chemotherapy treatment just because they were so desperate. So treatment options, we have to be really, really careful with because a lot of the patients, they are so vulnerable and they so much want to survive that they will grab on to anything that is out there, even if it is not medically proven um, options. 
Other things that we can try um, for treatment options is some people swear by diet treatments. Again, I'm, I'm really hesitant to say any of these. I do know a couple people who have controlled their cancer by completely changing their diet. Um, but again, that's a really cautious thing. It takes a lot of um, self-discipline and I mean, the cancer eventually came back and was overwhelming for them. So it's just really interesting, but there are some things, um, we've got a lot of things like, um, you know, acupuncture, I'm probably not going to get rid of cancer might help with some of the treatment. You know, a lot of those alternative treatments and alternative remedies they're going to maybe help someone feel more comfortable, massage therapy, any of that kind of stuff, really great to use, not great to use as a curative treatment. If we're trying to cure it as of right now, chemotherapy radiation, I think we're going to see an increase in the biotherapies increase, um, coming up because I think they're having some really good successes with those. And cancer treatments change a lot. So I think we will see the biotherapy stuff starting to climb, um, you know, using your own immune system to fight your own cancer. So I think we'll see more of those climbing, um, but those will be very, very specific to the patient. Now we've talked about, we found something, we did the biopsy, we got the staging, given them the treatment options, hopefully given a lot of resources for them to do those treatment options, but now it's go time. This is when, so they're going to go get their treatment, right? So they're now getting treatment. Um, and this is where everybody reacts differently, all right? So if you get somebody who has chemo, they may be throwing up consistently, right? Nausea, vomiting. So now we have to understand that Zofran is our medication usually of choice for that, but we have other ones. We have Ativan, which is a great medication um, for nausea with um, your cancer patients. Um, other things we might give, um, I'm trying to think like Haldol can be an anti-nausea med that we can give. Um, we don't give it as much, but you might see it sometimes. Benadryl. All right. Benadryl is another really good um, anti-nausea medication for patients that are um, going through chemo. So that nausea, vomiting, it, it's their body's just taking a hit. I think of chemo as a bomb. So their body's just taking a hit. Other things, um, radiation burns is something we might see. Um, and so big thing with radiation burns is that we wanna make sure we're taking care of the skin. We're probably gonna get an ordered cream to put on it. We're not gonna just put whatever cream we want. That skin's so sensitive and we don't wanna um, accidentally remove the marks. We want those marks to stay on there because it will um, create issues if we remove them. So we want to not necessarily put other creams on because some creams might take those marks off um, and they might burn more. Other symptoms for um, chemo, what we call alopecia, so losing the hair. And our hair is definitely um, who we are or part of our identity. I know um, Alex Trebek did an interview where he talked about the, the goal for people is to see if they can see the wig or they cannot see the wig and tell when he switched over to a wig. He did a really good job. I'm, I cannot tell when he switched to a wig. I'm guessing this is a wig because his hair looks really, really good. Something interesting about this picture also is look at his hands. His hands are not the same color as his face which tells me he's got a lot of makeup on. He's hiding a lot of discoloration, um, paleness, fatigue, and all that that comes with our cancer patients. So those hands are kind of almost a bluish color, which makes me wonder what kind of drugs he's getting. And his face is all nice and tan and perfect. So it makes me really curious where he is in his stages of cancer. He's hiding it very, very well. Thank goodness Hollywood has um, tricks and techniques for makeup, right? So other things that we got, we talk about is mucositis or stomatitis, depending on um, how you guys see it in the journals, but it's really pretty much the same thing. It's an opening that has um, sores in it. And these sores can be huge pain, hugely painful. So think about if you have mucositis and nausea vomiting, the last thing you're gonna wanna do is eat. And when patients need um, help, 
they need help with this. So you may not take care of somebody who you may be with them like as a nurse while they're just finding something. You may not be with them as they're getting their biopsy, but you might, you won't be in the office as they're discussing their treatment options, but you definitely will be here during go time. You will be here when they are going through the horrible um, discomforts of chemotherapy, the fatigue, and the exhaustion that comes with it. Oftentimes this fatigue is more even from radiation than it is from the chemo itself. Um, radiation literally just zaps the energy out of them. So you will be here during that go time. So think about the patients and the people that you have cared for in your, in your careers so far. Um, and where were they in this, in this spectrum of, of cancer care? Hopefully we got them to the cure phase. Hopefully we got them up here where we are cured from cancer, but that's not always. Sometimes we just, the cure is just not gonna happen, right? Cause remember cancer is just a cellular glitch. So sometimes that cellular glitch is stronger than the human um, spirit is. And so I really hate the idea of they battled or they lost, it's like, Sometimes the, the win or the lose wasn't the choice, but um, really encouraging people to, to live a good life um, and to you know find joy every day because winning or losing, you'll lose every time, right? So what does Patch Adams say is that if you, treat the, if you treat the patient, you win every time. If you treat the disease, win or lose, it doesn't matter. But if you treat the patient, you'll win every time. So make sure when you're working with um, your cancer patients, no matter if you're in the find something phase, the biopsy phase and understanding the nursing role during that, the treatment phase, the different options they're given, um, helping them and a lot of patient education through here and support um, as they're making those decisions. And these decisions are super, super personal to um, an individual to the person and what their goals are. And then the go time, that treatment, that treatment time. And like I said, hopefully that all gets them up to a cure, but that's not a promise. So making sure that we um, help them through this process, through each step of it, and we work with them as they're in the healing phase and we take care of not only the body, but the spirit, that holistic care becomes really, really important with our cancer patients and taking care of their families and their supports. So you can see that being an oncology nurse takes so much because it is really and truly probably one of the most holistic um, care patients that you will ever have. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I will see you in class.